You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, Alicia. Hello. And hello to our listeners. Welcome back to the third part of our Common Descent Podcast special spotlight mini-series. In this mini-series, instead of our normal format of discussing particular scientific topics, we're focusing on scientific people working in our favorite field of science. For this series, we've chosen the theme of invertebrate paleontology, and today we are joined by paleontologist Dr. Alicia Stigall. Alicia, if you would, please introduce yourself to our listeners. Hi, my name's Alicia Stigall, and I am a geology professor at Ohio University, and I'm an invertebrate paleontologist, and I focus on questions related to um, how species form, whether or not they change, how they relate to the environment, and I use my favorite group of fossils, the brachiopods, to help answer those questions. Very cool. Yes, and we'll ask you about a few of those different things, but let's start with the research you mentioned, in particular those uh, wonderful organisms. Uh, Our paleo-familiar listeners will probably recognize the word brachiopod. They're a pretty big deal in geology, but for the people that don't know, could you explain to us what are brachiopods and why are they so cool? Yeah, absolutely. So if you were going to get in a time machine and go back to visit the ancient oceans, any time between about 500 million years ago and 250 million years ago, and you're walking on the beach and you're picking up shells, the shells that you would pick up would be those of brachiopods. These are organisms that have two shells, kind of like a clam on the outside, but on the inside, they're completely different. Their organ systems are very different. They have a cool structure called a lophophore that they use to eat food particles. They don't have gills. They don't have any fleshy feet that you might have for dinner at a restaurant. But about 250 million years ago, they were hit by a big mass extinction. After that, the dominant shellfish have been the bivalves or the clams. And so brachiopods are still around today, but they're just not very common in the modern ocean. And so most people just don't know a lot about them unless you know a lot about geology. Very neat. Yeah, one of the classic questions in introductory geology classes, one of the classic quiz challenges is telling the difference between bivalves like clams Mm -hmm. and brachiopods. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a great one. Um, And fundamentally, they're actually really easy to tell apart, which is why we ask intro students to do so, because the way they build their shells is actually really different. They both have two shells, but in a brachiopod, the two shells are different different. One's bigger, one's smaller, but the right and left sides are mirror images of each other. But on a clam, it's just the opposite. The right and left sides look different, but the two shells are mirror images. So you can easily tell them apart once you learn that trick. But the important thing about the shells isn't just kind of what is their symmetry. The bigger question is what do they act- what mineral do they use to build a shell? And a brachiopod uses the mineral calcite and a bivalve uses aragonite. What's important about that is that in earth time, if we go over millions of years, aragonite breaks down and dissolves, but calcite is very resistant. So if you're looking at rocks that are very old, brachiopods will just be beautifully preserved. You see all the details in their shells and they just look spectacular. And in the same rocks, your clams, the shells will have dissolved and they'll look like a disgusting lump of mud. (laughs) So clearly brachiopods are vastly better <laughs> than part of Earth history, at least. Naturally. You heard it here, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Seems undisputable. One thing that you said, this is a very minor side question. Would brachiopods be less tasty than bivalves? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So a brachiopod on the inside, their organs are really, really small. And they don't have very much okay. fleshy material at all. So quite frankly, there's almost nothing to eat. Um, so they just don't work out in restaurants they're only there's one kind of brachiopod alive today called um, lingula and it has a really long pedicle which is this muscle organ and you can eat those in japan they will actually eat lingula pedicles but it's the only species of brachiopod that has enough like 
actually muscle tissue to be worth even trying to eat today. Interesting. Okay. Very good to know. I'll stick with clams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, clams are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> one's better for studying, the other one's better for eating. That's right. Yes. Balance. <laughs> Brachiopods de- developed the ability to survive fossilization and also uh, human taste buds. Yep. <laughs> So can you tell us a bit about your research? What exactly are you using brachiopods to learn? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I'm really interested in, um, and a lot of people are, it's a very interesting question overall, is how does a new species form? So fundamentally, I'm very interested in kind of looking at the relationship between speciation, how species form, as well as what happens um, during the kind of ecology. So if you've got sea level rise or fall, does a species of, of organisms, do they, do they shift their morphology or do they simply move laterally to track their preferred habitat? So asking questions like that, we really have to kind of combine evolution, ecology, and biogeography together. So I'm really interested in kind of looking at questions that sit at that nexus. To do that, you really need to have a group of organisms that has a very abundant fossil record. So we need to be able to figure out their evolutionary trees, we need to do phylogenetic analysis, but we also need to be able to map their geographic ranges with high confidence. So having organisms that are very abundant in in life, so in in particular brachiopods are very abundant on the seafloor, so we can actually map their geographic ranges with a high degree of confidence that would be basically impossible to do if you're looking at something like an apex predator. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah, there's this sort of trend that we've mentioned a couple times in this series so far of that that being one of those grand differences between vertebrate paleo and invertebrate paleo is that you can just by sheer number of fossils you can do things with invertebrates that you couldn't do with hardly any vertebrate animals. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And that's why a lot of invertebrate paleontologists like myself work in geology departments because the kinds of questions we can answer are about organisms and environments and how that relates to the sedimentary record. Whereas vertebrate paleontologists like yourself, you don't have very many specimens, but you have really cool biology. (laughs) A lot of cool biological questions about how do these things function as animals. And quite frankly, that wouldn't be very interesting to do very long with brachiopods. They sat on the seafloor and filter fed. (laughs) <laughs> they weren't running around hunting other things <laughs> or forming yeah. communities and social <laughs> structure <laughs> there's no ordovician park full of brachiopods <laughs> the brachiopods don't eat the tourists it would be pretty spectacular though <laughs> i'd like to see it submarine and go check out some ordovician seafloors that would be the best <laughs> aquarium hmm. do you have a particular research project that you're working on now or recently finished that you'd like to share with us Yeah, so um, one of the questions that I'm working on with a group of collaborators kind of around the world, actually, um, is trying to understand an interval of time called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. So for short, we call that GOBE, so G-O-B-E, so for Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. So um, what's exciting about this interval of Earth history so everybody knows about the Cambrian explosion. So I'll just pause there for a second. During the Cambrian explosion, it was a super exciting time because all of the major body plans first appear in the fossil record. And so we have this big first appearance of all of the major animal phyla. But those phyla aren't very diverse. They're very disparate. But there's not a lot of species of each kind of organism, and there aren't that many families or genera. But when we get to the Ordovician period, which follows the Cambrian, all of a sudden, we have this tremendous increase in diversity at the genus and family level. And so we actually start to fill in the seafloor with lots of organisms. But not only do we have more diversity, we have ecosystems that are, have a lot of biomass, and they start to resemble oceans of today with different players, right? We have brachiopods instead of clams, but it looks kind of like a seafloor that you might see today, but with different players. And we see that for the first time in the Ordovician. So what I'm working on with my colleagues is really trying to figure out why this happens. So what are the triggers in the environment that um, facilitated or allowed this dramatic diversification? So some of my colleagues are geochemists and they're looking at changes in the ocean chemistry or climatic temperatures. What I'm looking at is how we actually 
go um, and make species. So as you, as you know, to make a species, to make a new species, what you have to have is an old species that you then break into pieces. So you start with a big population and then from there you get is genetic isolation. And so you get genetic isolation in different populations and, and if they're isolated long enough and subjected to slightly different conditions, they will diverge into a new species. So I'm really interested in what is happening because this is really in the Ordovician during the Gobi, this is the time that we have a dramatic increase in speciation that we haven't seen before in Earth history. And so what, how is that happening? How is the interplay of the plate tectonic positions and the ocean currents, how does all that all work together to actually separate these genetic lineages? Very interesting. That's, yeah. a, that's a big question. <laughs> it is. That's why we've got a lot of people working on different angles. Um, so my, my piece is really thinking about the process of speciation. How do you actually isolate these populations? What, are really, what is really going on is we're doing you know, phylogenetic analysis, diversity analysis, ecology analysis, looking at brachiopods because they're one of the core groups that is really well preserved and really abundant during this time. I, I liked uh, when you were describing some of the things you were looking at uh, and how the animals can respond because uh, it's we often talk about you know that temperature change or sea level rise and fall can cause differences in the ecosystem which could cause different species but you also point out they could just move so that question of what does and doesn't cause speciation is a really interesting one. Yeah, you know, it, it is. And well, obviously I think it is. Because, <laughs> but, um, you know, what, what is one of the really great things about the fossil record and where we are in modern paleontology is that we have tremendous databases, things like the paleobiology database and other databases that allow us to do things like plot a diversity curve. So we can say, oh, look, there's more species than there used to be. Mm -hmm. And we also have great databases for geochemistry. And we say, okay, well, oxygen went up at the same time those species went up. And probably that's related. And it probably is. But it's not causal, right? Yeah, because right. You don't have to separate your populations into different gene pools in order to actually get speciation. And so one thing that I'm trying to do is really get to that link. We have these really good large-scale correlations, but how does more oxygen or a cooler ocean actually facilitate breaking into species? And that's something that as paleontologists, we haven't tackled a lot, and we haven't really wrestled with these questions um, in a really high level. And so that's kind of where I'm trying to go on this particular project. Very cool. And how do you do that? How do you, how do you make that <laughs> determination? It sounds like a tough thing to do. So it is. It's a hard thing to tackle. And, and really, that's, to be quite fair, that's why it hasn't been tackled. It's not because people haven't ever considered these questions before. But, you know, getting the information you need to really approach these questions um, takes some new methods and takes some paradigm shifting. And so the way that we're approaching it in my group is by building species-level phylogenies. If we can figure out what species how the species arose. So if we can figure out their evolutionary trees as the first step, and we also know where the species were living, so we can map the biogeography onto the evolutionary trees, and from there we can analyze the pathways. So did a speciation event occur because there was a broadly distributed ancestral species that broke into pieces, that's called vicariants, or did the speciation event evolve because there was an ancestral population in one area and a subset of it crossed some geographic barrier and instituted a new population and that, that's called dispersal. So we can actually, within a phylogeny, if we, we have the right tools now to actually track these questions, to look at the style of speciation. And if we can do that, we can start to pull that back into what are the geographic barriers, what are the oceanographic barriers, the kind of holdup or, or from an in, from an invertebrate paleontologist standpoint, what one of the major limitations of implementing such a research plan is that we don't have a lot of phylogenies. And so um, I actually quite often get kind of vertebrate paleontologists like phylogeny envy because <laughs> there are so many great phylogenies for different mammal groups or dinosaur groups that anytime that we want to look at a new brachiopod, 
and think about that, we have to go to basics and build a species level phylogeny as step one. So that's always, mm -hmm. step one. And, you know, so it takes a lot of years to build up kind of a library of these. And now we're finally at the level where we can actually start doing, you know, some of the synthesis analysis because we have enough phylogenies in place to start asking some of these interesting questions. Yeah, so you've had to be doing groundwork to set up the or, or or lay out what the relationships between these brachiopods are before you can start answering the big questions you're aiming for. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> that's awesome, but that's insane yes. that you had to do that each time. Well, my, my students are fantastic. I mean, <laughs> this is the kind of work you can't do by yourself. It's very much a collaborative effort. Very cool. Based on all that sort of foundational work and, and, and updated methodology that's going into these sorts of questions, would it be fair to say that the kinds of studies you're doing, the kinds of questions you're trying to answer, would not have been doable I, 10, 20 years ago? Yeah, I, I think that's fair. You know, maybe we could have done it 10 years ago, but, you know, the methods that we, we've got available as far as phylogeny reconstruction and biogeographic inference really are, are pretty new. Um, and so, so, yeah, we really couldn't do these things very long ago. And one other question that you, you keep talking about these sorts of species level and even it sounds like population level analyses with with brachiopods how much resolution so we've talked in some of our episodes about you know arguing when one species becomes another and and how just how much detail you can really get mm -hmm. population wise in the fossil record how detailed a picture can you paint of different species versus different populations versus different communities when it comes to brachiopods it really depends on the scale of your analysis so you know, some of the groups, we deal with species level work because we're dealing with museum collections. And in a museum collection, you're constrained certainly by the number of specimens that were reposited. And in that case, we often can't get the population level type questions. But on the other hand, they're, they're you know, one of my current students, research students, is actually doing a population level question. So he is looking at, his name's Ian, Ian's fantastic, and he's actually um, looking at this particular genus of brachiopods that occurs in the Ordovician around the Cincinnati, Ohio region, and we have thousands of these, and uh, they're, named, they're called Raffineschina, and they've been split into 20 species, or maybe there's really just two species, and quite frankly, we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because no one's really attacked the question of the population. So are, are these things just inter, intergradational or are they really, you know, have a morphological character that is discrete and would be recognized um, in a living group, in a, li in a living assemblage? Right. So, there, so, there, so it depends, basically, to, to get back to your actual question. It depends on what we're doing. Sometimes we can look at populations and I think even when we can't, it's very important to think about them because we want to think about these as, you know, biological entities and the processes that impact biological entities. And we can't always directly assess those, but we should always be thinking about them. Very cool. So one of the, you know, so I was talking a lot about the Great Ordovician Biodiversification event and kind of figuring out how we establish biodiversity. But one of the core things that's kind of inherent in that is looking at dispersal of species between areas. We talked about how that relates to speciation, but kind of in other contexts or kind of the overarching areas of research that I've been involved with involve, deal with how invasive species impact diversity through time. Oh, and interesting. So, yeah, that's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> So in that context, I, you know, so we've been working on this, this big picture stuff. So I've looked at the late Ordovician um, events, um, particularly there's this big invasion in the Cincinnati region called the Richmondian invasion. I've looked at the late Devonian biodiversity crisis or mass extinction and how that works and, and also kind of other invasions, um, not quite as in detail. But fundamentally what we come up with is there's this really interesting relationship between invasions through time and diversity. So if you've got a lot of invasive species moving through, so species that evolve in one tectonic basin within one particular community, but then later breach some barriers and move in to a new area. It's very similar to, to modern invasive species where humans are the introducers 
but you don't need humans, right? You can just have a species evolve one place, but if the geologic conditions shift, it can move. And when it moves into a new area, it could act very much the same way that a modern invasive species might. And so we've been looking at that question in great detail. And one of the things that we see is that that depresses speciation. So if you move in a bunch of species, they're usually ecological generalists. That usually causes a depression in speciation rate. Um, and the, the amount of time that speciation is depressed depends on the scale of the invasion. So if it's a small scale event, it's only into the basin, it might only cause some problems for a couple thousand years, uh, maybe a hundred thousand years or a million years in the case of a regional invasion. In the case of the late Devonian mass extinction, we actually see a depression in speciation rate for several million years. Um, and that's one of the major reasons that biodiversity declines during that interval of Earth history. So this, the, the way that species move around and the impacts of that are really important. And so they can cause these really big declines in biodiversity. On the counter side, we also see, for example, during the great Ordovician biodiversification event that you need dispersal. Because if you always have your basin separated, then you can't seed a new population that can later diversify. There's this interesting interchange that seems to occur in Earth history between intervals when we have dispersal and when we have vicariance or kind of that separation of basins. And so some of my students and I published a paper about a year and a half ago, and we called these BIMES, Biotic Immigration Events, because it's always good to have an acronym. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But it's very interesting, it's, I think it's really interesting the way that we can actually document both phases, both how immigration is foundational for future diversity, even though it actually reduces speciation at the time, and then how these really large scale dispersal events actually can have long lasting depression impacts. So it all kind of works together. Again, this kind of interplay between how evolution and ecology and biogeography all work together. Wow, that's fascinating. That's cool. I like that. That in, it's an interesting perspective that that one species dispersal is another species invasion. Yes, yeah, so that's what I was thinking about too. That's a really interesting dynamic. Yeah, and they they tend to be offset in time too. And of course, this isn't just in you know brachiopods of the marine realm. We can see all the same patterns if we look at terrestrial mammals. Mm -hmm. We've got right. you know, plastic, you know, dispersals and exchanges, and then the evolutionary impacts of that. If we look at you know the Great American Book. Um, biotic interchange, or we look at um, some uh -huh. of the, the great work that Catherine Badgley has been doing um, related to things um, in kind of Pakistan and, and areas around that too. Very cool. It's interesting to think of invasion because we, we hear about invasive species so much in the context of, you know, terrible things that humans are inflicting yeah. upon the world. For sure. And so the, the, it's, it's refreshing to be reminded that invasion is a very natural part of ecosystem evolution. How much do you look to modern day invasions to help learn about invasions of the past? A lot, actually. So I do a lot of um, kind of ground truthing of what we see in the past against what we see in the modern. One of the interesting features of that is, of course, there's been intensive study of modern invasive species. Billions of dollars a year is spent combating them, and so they're a significant concern um, on the economic front, which is one of the, the primary fronts that, you know, governments get involved. But yes. those darn bivalves <laughs> causing all sorts of trouble over here in this part of the world. Oh, yeah. Bivalves <laughs> have a lot of problems. <laughs> they're really endangered um, in places like... Um, streams that were in like Tennessee and places like that actually but but okay. yeah like zebra mussels are just a mess yes <laughs> yeah that's, that's all I've ever heard about zebra mussels is that they're a big mess <laughs> I I had a, a guess at the aquarium from uh up near the lakes and when we were talking about the sea stars and they're like oh these eat these eat like clams and stuff like that he's like oh you should bring them up there because we hate those zebra mussels <laughs> that was his immediate thought yeah they're they're amazing um, as far as their spread. But since we're talking about zebra mussels, we, they're a really good example of what we actually know and don't know about invasive species. So we, we can document their spread beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, and we can document, you know, how they got to North America through, you know, the ballast water of ships and where they came from. Mm -hmm. So we know a lot about them. What we don't know about zebra mussels is what their populations will look like or what the communities they've invaded will look like in a thousand years or 10,000 years. All of our information that we have about invasive species is decadal and in the best case, 
or worst case, you know, from the fact things have been invaded for a while. But best case scenario, we might have a century. So it's a very short time scale. And, you know, one of the things that we know very well is that you can't scale up short term dynamics into long term dynamics always. Sometimes yeah. you can, but a lot of times you can't. And so one of the reasons that I'm very interested in looking at the fossil record is to try and figure out what are these long term dynamics? What should we really expect from these long term invasions? And fundamentally, we're seeing a lot of the same patterns. Um, where, you know, it's the generalists that survive, the specialists tend to go extinct, mm -hmm. things that you would just predict from first principles. Um, but we're also seeing that species kind of narrow their niches as the kind of dominant mode of survival. And the invaders will do that too. So everybody starts off being a generalist in this post-invasion ecology, and then will kind of narrow their niches through time to sort of find a path to survive in the new higher competitive world. So it's very interesting to kind of look at these things. But I think the timelines are actually really similar. So we talk about zebra mussels kind of coming over and it was the larvae that were dispersing. If we have the same process in the past, it's not a tanker that's moving the larvae across, but it's ocean currents. Mm -hmm, so the sea right. level rises, you breach a barrier and ocean currents moving over some larvae that didn't previously have a pathway to move across. And so under that context, it's actually very much the same thing. And the timeline you might expect it to take a bunch of larvae to establish in a new environment is probably the same timeline. So we're really talking, even though we might not be able to see very tight snapshots, the process is probably operating on exactly the same time scales. I think that it is one of the wonderful things about paleontology. And of course, I'm biased. We're all biased. Uh, and it harkens back to something Will and I discussed in episode one of our podcast way back in the day. This episode, this discussion started off talking about a group of organisms that we had to ask you to introduce to our listeners because some people don't even know what they are. Mm -hmm. And we've ended up discussing implications for like economic benefits, something that's going to teach us things that governments or, or would be dramatically interested in knowing about just how those ecosystem dynamics work. So uh, we've talked a bunch about your research now, but in addition to your own research, Alicia, you, uh, you literally have a lab with your name on it. What is it like to be in charge of a, of a lab? Well, it's interesting. Being in charge of a lab is very, very much fun, um, but it's, it's interesting. You know, every now and then I've, I've talked with other scientists, you know, faculty members, and after after you get established as a faculty member, you realize that you're actually running a small business. Um, okay. And nobody trains you for this. They train you to do good science and write papers and write grants. And these are the things you cover as a grad student. But you're also in charge of a bunch of, of personnel, basically. And so you've got undergraduate researchers and graduate researchers. And, um, and what you wanted to do is facilitate the best possible scientific training and learning environment for them um, and, and train them how to, how to be good scientists and make fantastic contributions. And every single person that you're doing that with is, is a different human mm -hmm. with different strengths and different weaknesses. So that, that's really um, an interesting dynamic to start learning. And so as a young faculty member, when you first get your first few students, and you're trying to set up these enterprises, um, it's a steep learning curve. Um, <laughs> but at this point, I've, I've, you know, I've been a faculty member for 14 years. And so I've, uh, I've got a system. And oh, yeah, it, that's good. So there is a, it, there is a specific routine that we follow and there are deadlines. And so, you know, we're going to spend the first semester doing, you know, figuring out a research question. The second semester, we're going to write grant proposals and thesis proposals. We're going to fend that over the summer. We're going to get all the data and do the field work or museum work or get the bulk of the data collection. Fall of the second year, we're going to present preliminary results at the annual GSA meeting. Then we're going to come home, write it all up, and we're going to defend on time at the end of two years. Because um, I, I primarily work with master's students. We don't have a PhD program or a master's program. And, uh, and so those deadlines are kind of inscribed. And, and when the students walk in as a new student, I say, this is the system. This is how it works. Um, and, and so we have a really good system, and it's a well-calibrated system. However, every single person that walks in the door and is told the exact same system is going to experience that system differently because yeah. they're 
they're going to have different strengths and different weaknesses and different interests. And so, um, so we've got a very clear structure and then we figure out how to navigate that structure um, best for each person. And uh, so it's, it's just a tremendous amount of fun. Actually, my favorite part of being a scientist really is, is working with students and, you know, I, I love teaching. I love talking about awesome fossil stuff. Like the history of the earth is amazing. And I, I love teaching about it, but I really love working with students in the lab and actually getting them being excited about what they're mm -hmm. doing and, and coming up with new ideas and new data and new interpretations that no one in the world has ever thought of before. And just pushing back the frontiers of science. And it's, it's just so rewarding and so much fun to start, you know, to see the progression of a young scientist starting from, you know, someone who's just starting their master's degree, moving to a really competent scientist who is publishing their first papers by the time they graduate the lab. And uh, it, it's tremendously fun. The only downside really is that um, whenever they leave the lab, they, some of them will go on and, and do great things in the workforce and some some will go on and pursue PhDs. And uh, due to the limitations of American paleontology, there are almost no places to pursue a PhD in brachiopods. And so they all change phyla. And so oh, no. nobody is a brachiopod worker. Oh, no. Do they all turn to the dark side and work on bivalves? No, goodness. No, no. Okay. Well, that's good. much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I one of my students did a vertebra paleontology PhD and a couple have done echinoderms and one's doing forams, another one that um, did trilobites. So all highly respectable clades. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the, the, the guest we had on our last episode, Adrienne Lamb came through your lab, didn't she? That's right. She did. She's just fantastic. <laughs> oh, she was a great interview. Yeah, it was, it was a, lot a lot of fun. fun. I like your comparison with a, a lab to a small business because that's a, a point of view that running that kind of stuff I don't think most people get to have or, or are introduced to, uh, especially the the experience of you going from having a couple students to running a facility. Yeah, everyone's had that experience either where they've been promoted into a position at work and are now outside of their knowledge of what, how to do what they're doing or seen it happen to someone else. And so that's it's it's neat to hear that it can happen in a lab situation too. Yeah, and, and you're worried about things like, you know, finding grant money and mm -hmm. supporting them. And so there is this financial end. Uh, in addition to kind of managing personnel, you've got to manage the finances and make sure we've got, you know, the equipment we need. And um, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun though. Very cool. It's great to get that perspective because Will and I have both been in lab. And, and when we're talking about a lab, of course, we're, we don't mean necessarily a physical lab space, although I'm sure you have that as well. It's the collection of people in, mm -hmm. in the, on the university campus and all those other things you listed. And Will and I have been in that, right? We were yeah. in a graduate program, but we, I've never spoken to a person about who was in charge of it, about what all the work that goes into it and what it's like to be the person upon whose shoulders all that lab effort rests. You worry about them a lot. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think of my, my students, my research students as kind of, they're, they're part of my family and, uh, you know, in a different way than my children are because right. my children are, you know, crazy and they don't listen to me and grad students will sometimes listen to you better than a six year old, <laughs> uh, not always, but, uh, <laughs> but then we, then they go out and they graduate, um, but we, you know, we, we stay in touch and they, they check back in and we have really good relationships. And then as they move on to PhD programs, I tend to acquire more people in the family because they'll get lab mates and then they'll come back and, and you know, they'll be like, oh, Alicia's really good at talking about, you know, this aspect of, you know, being a scientist or, you know, lived experiences as a woman in science. Go talk to Alicia. And so I end up kind of informally advising kind of a, a much larger set of individuals than were actually my personal students in the first place, which is fun. And then we, every year at GSA, we have a, like a Stigall alumni dinner and, and, you know, so we'll have dinner with all of my, my former students. And my, my husband is also a, a paleontologist. And so his students too. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's just such a really nice family atmosphere. You've got both sides of it and you've got grand lab students. <laughs> yet but <laughs> we'll get there that will be really fun 
I, I got to say, that's really, really cool to see. You know, like we said, we've been through labs and, and we've been able to stay in touch to some degree with our professors mm -hmm. of the past. And it's really a, an experience that, that, that we can both sympathize with and that hopefully our listeners sort of get a, a sense of this if they haven't heard of it before, that notion that you really do build an academic family. And we used to, we always talked about, you know, we'd compare who went through what labs and uh, I had a professor who used to refer to certain segments of paleontology as very academically incestuous mm -hmm. because it's, everyone has the same advisors and you're yeah. constantly switching between all the same uh, right. upper level paleontologists. Yeah. And well, that's the fun part about my students graduating is they keep moving to different labs. And so in, instead of, you know, so we haven't had the incestuous situation, we just have the expansion. And so the network just gets bigger and the, the kind of science and the kinds of people that are involved get more and more diverse. And, um, and there's so much strength and diversity and it's just really just makes everything so much better. Very cool. That's excellent. What kind of work, obviously every lab has a focus in terms mm -hmm. of its scientific focus. What kind of work do your students get to do in the Stagall lab? Well, it's pretty varied. You know, some of my most recent students were working on freshwater snails from Oligocene of Tanzania and Pennsylvanian paleoecology of limestones from Ohio. So, um, <laughs> but mostly if I can convince them, then they'll be doing something or division with brachypods. Right. <laughs> um, but we do all kinds of things. So, I mean, it and it very much depends on the strengths and interests of every of, of a student. So we might do things like bedding plane, assemblage, paleoecology. We might, you know, a different student might be really excited about building species level phylogenies and so do a lot of museum work. A different student might want to, you know, compile data and look at biogeographic pathways. And so there, it's kind of a diversity, but they all really play somewhere into that kind of core triad where we're looking at how evolution ecology and, and biogeography all work together at, at some level. Given that you have this sort of, as, as you've described, that academic maternal position, uh, uh, raising students and sending them on their way, is there anything in particular, like if you had one thing that you try to impart upon your students that you hope, if, if they get anything out of this lab, what, what will they take away? Do you have any sort of one thing? Oh, that's a really good question. Honestly, I think the one thing that makes me happiest when students leave is that they have experienced working in a group where they have learned that excellence in science is critical to success, but it's not sufficient on its own. That you have to be a great scientist, but it's equally important to be a really wonderful person. And so being a scientist in the 21st century isn't simply about hiding in a lab and testing hypotheses and collecting good data and writing a paper. You also need to learn how to interface with the public, how to actually communicate science in an effective way um, to school kids or the, you know, at the library. But it's important that you not only build that knowledge for yourself or for the scientific community, but for the community at large. And so that's something that's very important to me that my students learn by the time they finish. That is an excellent message. I agree. I think that is that is also crucial. Yeah. Of course, we're we're as always biased. We are scientists <laughs> and science communicators. Communicators, yeah. <laughs> though. Right. Right. So one other thing that we wanted to ask you about, uh, as we've said in the last couple episodes, as we were sort of getting these interviews together, we came across the slight issue that it's kind of hard to get a hold of scientists over the summer because they tend to be very busy. And we are catching you in between conferences this summer. Last week, you actually hosted a conference, right? That's correct. What was that conference and what is it like to not just to attend a conference, but to be in charge of a conference? Yeah, so I was mentioning way back at the beginning of this interview, this group of, of scientists that I work with and kind of this global consortium about the GOBI. And um, so we have a project, it's a IGCP project, which stands for International Geoscience Program, Project 653, the onset of the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. And it's funded by UNESCO. And basically UNESCO gives me and my, my colleagues a couple thousand dollars every year. Um, and that's to um, support scientists that are very early career or from 
uh, economically disadvantaged nations to attend meetings. To, so we host meetings and we have some money to bring people in that might not otherwise attend. So fundamentally, this group is geoscientists very broadly. So we have paleontologists, but we also have chemostratigraphers, and we have people interested in tectonics and reconstructing paleoceanography. And, but we're all excited about this time in Earth history. And so we get together every year and we take turns hosting the annual meeting. So it was my turn. It was the first time we'd hosted the meeting in North America. So we had kind of this very diverse group of scientists, kind of intellectually diverse, but also globally diverse. Um, so we had people from eight countries and we had about 60 participants come to Ohio University. Wow. It was fantastic um, scientifically. We, but one of the other things we do with this program is we don't only give talks in, inside. We also go out and look at rocks. So we had four days in Utah, Nevada, preceding the scientific sessions in Athens. And then well, a total of three days in Kentucky, all looking at kind of Ordovician rocks. And uh, so it's great because when you're in the field with a group of 20 or 30 scientists, you have time to have these kind of detailed conversations. You make observations together and you think about how your experience, how, the, how what you're seeing fits into your experience and how it fits into their experience and how together you can compare and contrast and build these new interpretations. And fundamentally, that's just what's so great about IGC projects is you get all these different kinds of scientists, but you sit and you talk and you think together about all these kind of interesting ways that the world works that you wouldn't necessarily get if you're just at a GSA session um, or an SVP session where you're all talking to people that are kind of like you. So talking to people very different from you is, is really very fun. So, so yeah, I was in charge of that. Um, so I spent kind of the last couple months um, sort of as my full-time job, getting things organized mm -hmm. um, for the conference, figuring out, you know, we had, we had a bunch of people from around the world and, and Athens, Ohio is an hour and a half from an airport with no public transportation. So, you know, when are people arriving? And what shuttles can we run to the airport? And who's going to room with who? And what dorm room? And <laughs> um, with all these kind of very small um, decisions and organizational things that need to be done. And I'm a very detail oriented person and I like things to go according to plan to the extent that I can. So I have very dramatic plans and, and then I had backup plans where my initial plans didn't work. And, um, and I had a wonderful group of students um, just doing a great job kind of organizing things and running shuttles. And, um, and it was scientifically, it was tremendous. Personally, it was exhausting. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. I can only imagine. Did you have to organize the field trips too? I um, I invited people to be the leaders of the field trips. Okay. So I, I I provided assistance and the credit card and you know that kind of stuff, but um, they were in charge of organizing the schedules, which was which was great because then I got to see new science and new rocks. Mm -hmm. and I hadn't been, and it was it was really great. Oh yeah. Field trips. We, you know, we actually did a whole episode on our main series about SVP, which is mm -hmm. our, you know, the big vertebrate paleo conference. And we didn't actually, one thing we didn't really talk very much about is that especially geoscience and paleo conferences are really big on field trips. We love going on field trips to nearby places. Uh, and you made the very good point that it gets paleontologists and geologists and such talking, not in chairs in a conference room, but out in their natural environment, right? Out, mm -hmm. out of the fields. Right. Well, and you know, and so a lot of us got into geology or paleontology because we like to be outdoors. And those sorts of people, you know, field experiences are really powerful. But of course, that's not, of course, the only way to be an, an amazing paleontologist or geologist. We have lots of great scientists that do museum-based work and, and work that is more lab-based. And so um, for a certain type of science, the field experience is really important, but certainly there are many other, you know, ways to be a scientist than simply through kind of um, the field endeavors as well. Right. That's very true. Mm -hmm. What is, what is the hardest part about hosting a conference? <sighs> Everything is always changing. <laughs> so just when you have a list set of exactly who you think is coming and what time their flights are, that'll change. Um, or someone will tell you when you're in Utah that they would really like to, you know, just add a room in the dorms if they could, you know, in two days. And so there's just a lot of these kind of last minute things. Um, but 
And that I actually kind of expected. What the part that was hard that I didn't expect was the just inherent difficulty of dealing with catering uh, on campus. Oh, <laughs> uh, you would think it would be straightforward. It's our university. It's our <laughs> caterers. They will just talk to me and they wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> but it was last minute. It was very last minute. And, you know, I, and as I mentioned, I don't like last minute. I wanted things that could be handled like bringing me coffee at 1030 and let's just schedule that shouldn't, shouldn't have needed to be a last minute thing, but it turned out it was, and it was, it was interesting. I learned quite a lot organizing the meeting, but it was so wonderful once everyone was here because I'd spent, you know, months emailing back and forth with people. And, and so once I got, then I got to meet everybody. And when they, when they arrived, I was like, many of them I already knew, but the new people to me, I was like, Oh, but you're like old friends because we've emailed six times about your flight <laughs> schedule or, you know, your visa situation or, or, or whatever. And so it was, it was really nice. I felt very, I, I'm, I tend to be very shy around new people and I get very nervous, but all of these, all of the participants felt like people I already knew. So I didn't have the usual kind of angst that I get at conferences. So it was lovely. It's, it's great to be there. It's great to organize meetings. It's, lots of fun. <laughs> it's, it's like having all the complication of organizing a group event with friends, plus the fact that it's a bunch of people that <laughs> don't live there and, Right. are flying in from yeah. seven other countries yeah wow that's excellent well done <laughs> yes congratulations <laughs> on what sounds like a very successful conference <laughs> it, really was. It, it was it was great so how nice does it feel to be going off uh what next week i think to someone else's conference yeah, it's so right. It's it's a very different experience. So yeah, the next place I'm headed is the International Paleontological Congress, which meets every four years. And this will be in Paris, France, and there are about a thousand participants. So okay. completely different setup than the 60 people yeah. um, that are very focused on the Ordovician. It's like a thousand people, all kinds of paleontology, all sorts, any sort you can think of somebody there is is doing that <laughs> and so um so it's a completely different atmosphere so instead of being like a group of friends with that I have a lot in common with there's certainly a group of friends there that I have a lot in common with but so many people that are strangers um and so back to that kind of like meeting angst <laughs> nope. um, we are having an, a, a goby session and I you know and that will be like oh yes home base friends safe zone um, and there's also just going to be like so many people. It'll be great to see a lot of the colleagues from Europe that I don't get to see every year. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And it is, it is nice not to need to worry about the catering. <laughs> nice. I got to say one thing that you've, you've said a couple times now that I really appreciate. And perhaps some of our, we do have listeners who are scientists and perhaps they will appreciate it as well to hear a person who has a lab and has been a faculty member for 14 years and has been, you know, is by every measure a seasoned professional in this field to admit to having meeting angst mm -hmm. is very nice to hear. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> yep. Cause me too. Every time yeah. uh, I, I have big outsider uh, uh, syndrome or whatever it's called. Whenever I go to uh, conferences where it's just like, you all are professionals and I'm just here to listen to you. Don't, you don't need to talk to me. I'm just sit back here. You know, it gets better as you move through because every time you go to a conference, you connect with a few new people and that zone of people you're comfortable with expands through time. And so after 14 years of being a professor and five years of grad school, I've been doing this, I guess I've been going to these meetings for like 20 years. And so my, my comfort zone is pretty big now. <laughs> yeah. But I was super, you know, but even with people that are on the edges of it, I've still got really nervous and yeah, I do the imposter syndrome. I definitely still do that. Yeah. Same here. Even I started going to the meetings as a reporter where it was my job to talk to people and boy, did that oh, that's hard. spur me to get over some of that <laughs> social anxiety a little bit. Excuse me. Could I talk to you? Cause I have to. Yes. <laughs> Please talk into this microphone. Wonderful. Is there anything else uh, big sciencey coming up in your in your summer? No. Well, I'm so once I get home, then I've got lots of you know kind of catching up on papers. I've got a couple of new students coming in the fall, and I'm very excited 
about figuring out what they're going to be working on. And so starting to put some grants together to think about some ideas of, of how we can fund different projects and, um, and working through a lot of the collaborations. So part of, of course, what happens when you go to conferences is you have these fantastic conversations about, you know, oh, yes, I do this and you do that. And together we can do this amazing thing. Right. Um, and then you have to go home and do the amazing thing. So <laughs> I've, got, I've got a lot of amazing things that has been discussed in various places. And it'll be exciting to sit down and actually start trying to work through some of those ideas and see if they're actually amazing. Um, right. Sit down and try to do <laughs> Well, Alicia, this has been a wonderful conversation. It's been fantastic to get insights into your research and your, your various jobs. If our listeners have enjoyed this as much as we have, where might they find you on the vast internets? Yeah, so I have a lab website, which is aliciastagal.org. And we post updates there and you know links to papers and some pictures from recent trips. I also um, have a very minimal Twitter presence. Um, I try, Same. but it's, I'm just not good at these things. Okay. And we'll put links to both of those in the episode description. Well, this has been a wonderful interview. Uh, Alicia, thank you so much for joining us for this. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. It's been wonderful to talk with both of you. It really has. It's been nice getting to hear from the, the other side of research of the people helping facilitate people doing research, which has been very cool. Yes. <laughs> Now you understand why brachiopods are inherently superior to bivalves. So that's I'm, that's yeah. that is one of the side things we do with our podcast is establish which groups of animals are superior to which other groups. <laughs> we've had a poll we've done in the past, so I'm glad we can put another one of those to rest. So you're saying brachiopods are the snakes of invertebrates? <laughs> <laughs> now with the got it. Are. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you also to our listeners for joining us for this. Hopefully you've been keeping up with this series so far. If you have, let us know. If you like it, we might do more of these in the future. If you, even if you don't like it, we've got more coming in this particular series. So stay tuned for part four of our Spotlight series where we will interview yet another person from within paleontology. Until then, uh, sign off phrase. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs> See you, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.